The date of May 11, 1935, should be regarded as a milestone for rural Americans, for it was on this day that President Franklin D. Roosevelt, by executive order, created the Rural Electrification Administration. When this program began, only 10% of America's farms had electricity. Today, it is rare to find a rural home, farm, or business not reliant on the benefits and comforts of electric service. The November 21st, 1935 Park Region Echo tells of a meeting held at the high school in Alexandria. Rural electrification plan in Douglas County okayed by mass meeting. 350 farmers asked government aid for farm lines. That headline summarized the farmers' feelings at the time, and they expressed their desire for electricity by signing a petition for a cooperative line in Douglas County. Douglas County Light and Power was incorporated November 30, 1935, electing first board of directors. In early 1936, the cooperative began its campaign to sign up farmers for electricity. Getting farmers to sign up wasn't always that easy, as Bob Henning of Miltona recalled. And uh, on my first job with the REA, I got the book to sell stock, and that was $5 per stock. But the people were so poor in them years, they didn't have the $5, so I said, give me two and a half dollars, then I'll give you a share of stock. Mm -hmm. And then went on that way, and I went from farm to farm, and some places, they just about chased me off of the yard. When it was first started, of course, one thing that made it so bad, the people didn't have no money in the 30s. They didn't have money. One fellow even told me, uh, I don't have any money. Can I get along the first few years with just one wire? Having been brought up on a farm, Senator Henrik Shipstead could appreciate the position of farmers who called on him one day at his Minnesota camp on Lake Irene to ask if there was any way to get power rates reduced so that rural dwellers could afford the convenience of electricity. After a summer of planning, Shipstead returned to Washington and discussed his program with President Roosevelt. The president was interested and lent his support to the legislation that Shipstead introduced into the Senate. The first headquarters of Douglas County Cooperative was in the basement of the courthouse in Alexandria. It was during this time, July 1st, 1936 to be exact, that the cooperative received a $50,000 loan at 2% interest from the federal government for its first 56 miles of line. One of the true pioneers in bringing electricity to this area was Cliff Hovey who not only served on the co-op's board of directors, but also wore the title of project superintendent during the young cooperative's developing years. Under his guidance, holes were dug by hand. Poles with insulators attached were erected, and a special reel paying out all four strands of wire at the same time with identical tension was used to roll out the wires. On June 1, 1937, the first wire of Douglas County's lines were strung on poles seven miles northeast of Garfield. John Wilkin, who served as board president for 18 years, is pictured here climbing the first pole. This first line is known as the Shipstead Hovey Line and extended from LeGrand Township in Douglas County to the east side of Lake Irene, where Senator Shipstead's cottage was located. With its completion in September 1937, 45 farms were powered by the growing cooperative from Douglas County. The Art Floating Farm near Lake Brophy was the first farm to have its power turned on by Runestone Electric. This occurred September 8, 1937. Brophy Lake Resort is now at this location. Meta Schempf was born and raised in Douglas County and recalls the day the lights came on. In 1937, the REA built lines north of Alexandria along what is now County Road 34. It was very exciting as they put up those big poles and brought rolls and rolls of wire along the driveway. Since I was four years old, I was kept far back out of the way. My father had the foresight to buy some books in order to learn how to wire the farm buildings. He then stocked up on wire, switches, outlets, motors, light fixtures, breaker switch boxes, etc. 
We had three-way switches and fluorescent light fixtures, all purchased just before World War II. With all the rationing, we would have had to wait several years until the war was over in order to get electricity. But in May 1942, shortly after the United States was involved in the war, my dad had completed the wiring and conversion of the washing machine and the well and the milking machine all to electricity. The inspectors came and they checked to see that he had done everything correctly. And then they turned the power on. You can only imagine what it was like day and night. We all rejoiced in getting several appliances, like the refrigerator, the vacuum cleaner, and the iron. Once in a while, during a power outage, we had to milk the cows by hand and carry the lantern around to feed the animals. We then remembered how glad we were to have electricity. Now, the original 80 acres of our farm has been 120 years in our family. I'm almost 80 years old and realize, well, I may live in Michigan, but I still have strong ties to the land in Douglas County. The location of the cooperative's headquarters has changed several times since its beginning in the courthouse. From that location, it moved to Washington School, where it shared quarters with the county agent, to an office over the First Farmers National Bank, where it remained for two years. In November of 1938, Douglas County Light and Power Association moved to this building, sometimes referred to as the Landine or Myers Building, on North Broadway in Alexandria, where Fort Alexandria now stands. Yet another location change took place in 1944 when the association moved into this building on Fillmore Street. Then, in 1951, Runestone Electric moved into its present building. The cooperative will be relocating its headquarters to the current operations center south of Alexandria on Highway 29 in the summer of 2013. In the early 1940s, the Douglas County Cooperative was busy wiring country schools and churches, Poles Reach Alexandria was the headline in September 1946 newsletter, and material scarcity during the war years made a scene like this a happy one. For a brief one-year period, the association's name was changed to Douglas County Electric, but in June 1949, the name of the cooperative was officially changed to Runestone Electric Association, recognized the cooperative's expansion beyond Douglas County. This man, Joe Perino, became the association's second manager, replacing Cliff Hovey as manager in April 1953. Hovey's term as manager had seen the cooperative grow from 50 miles of line to 2,200 and from a $50,000 project to one that was worth nearly $3 million. The Willie Wirehand Free Bulb Replacement Program was implemented in 1957, the insignia represented the rural electric cooperatives and was the counterpart to the private utility's ready kilowatt symbol. Under this program, Runestone members received a free bulb if the one they had purchased from Runestone burned out. In 1960, Runestone built an all-electric home in Alexandria's Crestwood Hills. This house, known as the Gold Medallion Home, was built by the cooperative to show how electricity could be used in every phase of living. During the mid-1970s, Runestone Electric Association would become involved in one of the most hotly disputed topics of that decade, a 400 kilovolt direct current power line built by Cooperative Power Association and United Power Association. This controversial line stretches from the Coal Creek Station in Underwood, North Dakota, to just west of the Twin Cities. The power line was built because of the growing electrical loads and as an alternative to buying power on an uncertain open market. Coal Creek Station, now owned by Great River Energy, is a lignite burning plant and supplies most of the power to Runestone Electric still today. REA also receives an allotment of hydroelectric power from the Missouri River. April 30, 1978 marked the retirement of Joe Perino, and on January 1, 1979, Vern Judela became REA's general manager. 
Judela was succeeded by Alexandria native Rick Banke in 1987. Rick is only the fourth CEO in Runestone's 75 years of existence. The 80s saw REA implementing a voluntary peak awareness program. This successful load management program has grown and expanded to a flagship program offered by the cooperative as a means to help members reduce heating and cooling costs. Diversification describes the 1990s as Runestone Electric braced for the possible effects of restructuring the electric industry with deregulation. Although Minnesota did not proceed with deregulation, REA entered into a number of partnerships and subsidiaries, including REA ALP Internet Services, Heartland Security, Star Energy Services, REA Electrical Contracting, and Ellingson Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning. By 2012, Runestone's active participation in subsidiaries included Heartland Security and Star Energy Services. One important core value of Runestone Electric is being committed to the communities we serve. Numerous programs have come and gone over the years, including the first electric cooperative in the nation to offer a group life and hospitalization insurance plan for its members. The Caring Member Program, a precursor to Operation Roundup. Care Call Phones, support of 4-H and other rural youth activities. Mutual aid to communities locally and across the country following natural disasters. And the introduction of the Co-op Connection Card. Electricity itself has not changed in 75 years, but the business of selling electricity has sure run the gamut. From a cooperative actively promoting the increased use of electricity to a mandated business model that strives for the conservation of energy. Celebrating the cooperative way of life has been a tradition at Runestone Electric. 2013 will mark the 40th year of the Coal Creek Tour in which members are able to visit the power plant and supporting facilities that deliver safe, reliable electric power to their homes, farms, and businesses. Another annual event is the Member Appreciation Pancake Feed, held Saturday of the Douglas County Fair at REA's Operations Center. The Pancake Feed brings friends and neighbors together for a morning of great food and fellowship. Annual meetings have typically drawn huge crowds over the years, as this photo indicates. Although the crowds are smaller today, the importance of the annual meeting remains. Many members look forward to their capital credit check each year. Sharing dividends, known as capital credits, is another important difference that sets electric cooperatives apart from other power companies. From its humble beginnings as the Douglas County Light and Power Association with 